Welcome everyone to this week's edition of the Extracellular Vesicle Club. This is an event of the International Society for Extracellular Vesicles and I am Kenneth Whitwer. I am the chair of science and meetings for ISEV and I've been hosting this event. So today we have a, um, a special presentation by one of my colleagues here at Johns Hopkins, uh, Dr. Mark Halushka. And so Dr. Dr. Halushka is also the, uh, the director of our program for microRNA studies at Johns Hopkins. And so he um, approached me recently and uh, told me about this uh, very interesting paper that's come out in Nature last month and asked if he could present to the Journal Club. So we're also very fortunate. So before I hand this over to Mark, we're fortunate to have um, a few of the, the authors of the paper on the call. Hey. Rano, hi. Hi, Ruben. Welcome. welcome. So I just wanted to, um, to, to, to welcome you. Thank you for contributing this, uh, this, this paper and coming here for the discussion. Um, so I'm wondering if you wanted to say just a few words about the, the impetus behind this work and uh, just tell us a little bit about the process of, uh, of, of getting this published. So, uh, well, first of all, thanks for um, presenting our work today. It's uh, very exciting to see to see that and to see so many people um, feel interesting uh, by this work. So actually, uh, it took us uh, many years um, to develop this project and also to publish the work. And uh, so I think, um, so initially we, we had the, the idea to um, study all the microRNAs that are, are present in the exosomes from many different cell types and see uh, what can you find in common and what you um, what is specific to each of these cell types. And uh, so, Dr. Haluska, which um, nice to nice to see you in person or virtually, uh, yeah, he will um, show that. Uh, but we have seen that um, some common and some specific uh, features of the microRNA secretion in exosomes between different cell types. We also believe that this has uh, many potential um, for therapeutics in the future, uh, but the, we, we will see with the next years. And um, I don't know if Ron wants to add something. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Hi, welcome, Ron. Uh, hi, uh, thanks for inviting us. And uh, so I don't know what Ruben said, but we're happy to be here and I'm interested to hear uh, uh, what Mark has to say. Uh, uh, this was a complicated and very long study, uh, both uh, before it was sent in for review and equally long after it was sent in for review. So uh, it's, it's been a, a challenging area and an area where we, we think we've made progress, but we think there's a lot to be done. So we'd be happy to hear more about this as well. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for uh, for coming on today, and we're we're looking forward to uh, to hearing more. Now, I think we can uh, go ahead and get started. So, Mark, I will hand the screen sharing over to you. Okay. Thank you, Ken, so much uh, for that. And so, uh, welcome everybody who's come on to talk about this uh, interesting paper that just came out in December in Nature on microRNA sequence codes for small extracellular vesicle release and cellular retention. And I think there's sort of a backdrop to this story is two different questions. The first question is, are microRNAs commonly carried by extracellular vesicles? And the classic paper in the space was the Velati paper in 2007 that said, yes, uh, exosomes carry microRNAs and they carry a lot of microRNAs. And that was sort of the, the gospel that I knew for a long time until this very interesting paper came out in 2014 by Manish Tiwari's group that said that, yes, exosomes do carry microRNAs, but they carry them at very low levels. Uh, I think both agree that there are microRNAs in exosomes. And if you have enough exosomes, it probably doesn't matter how many each of them carry, you'll still be able to transfer a lot. But I think that was the first interesting question that came up about microRNAs and extracellular vesicles. The next big question is how do microRNAs end up in extracellular vesicles? And there have been a number of different papers that have also supported a sorting mechanism that if you look at the microRNAs between the cells and the extracellular vesicles, you find differences in the absolute counts of those. And I think of the papers, the first big hit was uh, 2013, the Villaroya Beltry paper that found an RNA binding protein, HNRNPA2B1, that bound to a GGAG microRNA motif. Uh, another paper in 2016 by Santangelo found the protein Syncrypt bound to GGCU. And in 2019, another paper by Timoch Diaz found the lupus LA protein bound to a UGGA microRNA motif. So those are several of, I think, probably a few more 
papers that have found these motifs and RNA binding proteins suggesting there's this mechanism. On the other side of the ledger was a paper by Juan Pablo Tozar that said actually he thought it was more random, that if you had a microRNA that was highly expressed in a cell, you'd see high levels of the microRNA in the extracellular vesicle, and if it was lowly expressed in the cell, you'd see low levels of that microRNA. And I think that's one of the main places where this paper today sits. It's really a question of can we gain more insight into motifs that regulate microRNA movement into extracellular vesicles? And so let's start at the beginning. Uh, this experiment was done across five different mouse cell lines. We see that here in figure A. And essentially what they did was compare the microRNAs in those cells to the microRNAs found in their extracellular vesicles. And by principal components analysis, we see that the cells were all generally here while the extracellular vesicles were elsewhere suggesting some differences between the two. Now, before I go any further, this is an ICEV journal club. So I need to say something about the extracellular vesicle isolation method. Cells were incubated in extracellular vesicle free fetal calf serum for 48 hours. Then the media from these were centrifuged for five, at 500 G for 10 minutes, 2000 G for 10 minutes, 10,000 G for 30 minutes. And then the supernatant was centrifuged at 100,000 G for 70 minutes. And again, 100,000 G for 70 minutes. They had done some additional studies also using size exclusion chromatography, which I'm not going to get into here. This is all uh, data from their supplemental materials. And you can see that uh, it is, these are extracellular vesicles as noted by strong staining of CD9 and this uh, Western blot TG101 and Alex, all elevated compared to cell. They saw different amounts of extracellular vesicles by cell. They had a nice EM picture of extracellular vesicles here. And we can see a uh, distribution of around 150 or so uh, diameter in nanometers. So that was all the supporting data showing these are clearly extracellular vesicles. On the other side, how did they approach microRNA profiling? And here they initially used a quantitative PCR, qPCR based kit from System Biosciences that had 709 mature microRNAs. And the way you do this is you put a poly A tail on all of the transcripts in the cell or extracellular vesicle, and you simply amplify them by qPCR. The uh, reviewers recommended that they actually do small RNA sequencing, so they did follow up with small RNA-seq done in a nano V2 kit using a NexSeq 500 system, an alignment method of primary chiaseq microRNA quantification pipeline of Kyogen's gene globe data analysis center. This is actually a tool I've never used. Uh, if someone has some experience, maybe you can put that in the chat. And by the way, feel free to put any questions or thoughts in the chat as we move along. We'll have lots of time to discuss. Again, there's a difference between cells and extracellular vesicles, and we should figure out what is going on. So one of the first things they did was look to see if some of the microRNAs had cell specificity or if they were ubiquitous. And you can see at the cellular level, 454 microRNAs were ubiquitously expressed or shared, and then there were some microRNAs that were specific. The same was also true for extracellular vesicles. Now here we look to see what were the defining microRNAs of the different cell types. And you can see that for AML12 cells, which is a hepatocyte cell line, we see the classic MIR122 5P. This is a microRNA known to be highly expressed in, exclusively expressed in hepatocytes, so that's excellent. We also see some typical epithelial markers such as 192 and MIR200C. Down here, we see a couple of myomeres, microRNAs known to be expressed in myocyte cells, and we see that C2C12 cells, which are a myocyte cell type, are strongly expressing those. That's great. These are endothelial cells, and we're actually not seeing MIR-126, which is a classic endothelial cell marker, so it's a little odd, but we see a collection of MIR-466 and MIR-467 microRNAs. Now, here is uh, looking at the different microRNAs, whether they might be enriched in extracellular vesicles in a universal pattern, cell type specific, or universally enriched in the cells, and we're seeing a nice spread. We see these microRNAs here, these 13 microRNAs, are all generally globally enriched across all five cell types. So I apologize if you're colorblind, but on the left side, that's red, and on the right side, that's blue. And you can see that there's red on the left side, meaning extracellular vesicles across all five cell lines, and blue essentially on the right. You can see that some of these are really 
big enrichment. Uh, this is mirror 686, and you can see that the fold enrichment is about 840 fold higher. A lot of these are around 100 or more. Uh, so that's the universal enriched. We also have some cell type specific enrichment, enrichment differences between the cell types. Here, for example, for AML12, we see these three microRNAs, MIR 690, 1931, and 709, are all highly enriched, whereas over here in 3T3L1 cells, you note they are not enriched in extracellular vesicles. And then down here, we see a number of microRNAs which are universally enriched among cells, included are uh, some LET7s, LET7I, LET7A1, and LET7C1 uh, down here. Okay, a little more data on how they look for enrichment in microRNAs. They took the spread of expression of those microRNAs and looked for fold change greater or less than four. And so you can see here for BAT cells, the number of microRNAs that were not enriched was 287, the number that were cell enriched was 205, and the number that were SEV enriched was 173. So about half of all microRNAs had selective distribution if you look across these four cell types and only about a quarter if you look at the endothelial cells at the bottom. Here we're looking now at cell-enriched microRNAs, and you can see that there were 43 which were ubiquitously shared uh, in all cell types relative to extracellular vesicles, and only 13 that were SEV-enriched ubiquitously across all the cell types. We can see that there were a lot more uh, EV-specific or cell type-specific microRNAs seen here and seen here as well. Okay, so at this point we have established that cells and exosomes have different microRNAs that are expressed and we're seeing these big differences. And then the question is, well, is there a motif that is associated with that? Can we find some feature that suggests why certain microRNAs are found in cells and why certain microRNAs are found in exosomes? So the authors turn to a tool called Hypergeometric Optimization of Motif Enrichment, or HOMER. And I absolutely love the name of that tool. That is the icon for the tool, which is classic. I'm a huge Simpsons fan, and that's great. And so they used it to look for exomotifs or cell motifs. And they described core exomotifs as having four nucleotides, and they looked for extended motifs up to seven nucleotides in length. And they did it cell type by cell type, by cell type, by cell type. So a couple of things to note here is uh, the, uh, they had initially described everything with a p-value, which ranges from about 10 to the minus 2 to 10 to the minus 9, but then went back and made sure everything had a false discovery rate of less than 0.1. So that is true of everything except this one CAUG right here. Uh, a couple of motifs of interest that we're going to be talking about a lot more in this manuscript are CAUG, which is seen here, seen here, and seen here again across three different cell types, and the CGGGAG motif that's seen here in endothelial cells. And this also gets used later, as does the UGUGU uh, for a few experiments. Uh, of note, we also nicely see the motif of Villaroya Beltry, which was the GGAG motif. So we're seeing that in this cell type, uh, AML12 cells here, and the SVEX cells below. We do not see the motifs that have been described by Santangelo and Timos Diaz, the GGCU or the UGGA motifs, as you can see. Okay, so a number of different motifs are seen that are found in microRNAs that are put into the extracellular vesicles. On the other side of the ledger, these were enriched in cells, microRNAs that stayed inside the cells, and these were called cell motifs. Again, we had core cell motifs here, they were four or five nucleotides in length, and then the extended were the longer motifs. Same sort of idea, same general p-values of significance and false discovery rates. I think if you squint your eyes and say what looks different between cell motifs and exomotifs, I think we see a lot more A nucleotides here, more adenosines, and over here we see a lot more G nucleotides. So in a global sense, there seems to be a difference between the A's and G's. Okay, now that we've established there's these differences, an important question comes up is, can you modify these motifs to direct trafficking? And the answer is yes. So if you take MIR 431 5P wild type here and then modify it to add a cell motif to it, do you get 
more of it being retained in the cell? And the answer is yes. So this is looking at the extracellular vesicle enrichment, which uh, this amount was there in the wild type. And then it decreased when you added a cell motif saying, hey, stay in the cell. And it did. If you take away that same motif from a microRNA that has that motif, more of it is pushed into the extracellular vesicle. And if you take away all the cell motifs from this microRNA, you see an even larger spread of that microRNA saying, hey, you're not wanted here in the cell, go to the extracellular vesicle. And it does that. You can also do that on the exomotif side. So those are cell motif changes. These are exomotif changes. If you modify MIR34C5P to add UGUGU, CAUG, or CGGGAG, you increase the amount of that microRNA going into the ex, uh, extracellular vesicles. And I should add that these are modifications. These aren't being added at the end and extending them. They're just nucleotide changes on the inside that are allowing them to have these motifs. So that was done for MIR34C, and that was also done for MIR26A for CAUG and CGGAG. I don't know if they didn't do UGUGU or it, they did it just didn't show anything. They didn't share it. Uh, this is a pretty tight uh, difference here, and if it kind of tracks with this, maybe that's why we're not seeing it there in figure three. Okay, so then the next question the authors asked, which is a great question, is well, what proteins are controlling this trafficking? And so they did this experiment in differentiated BAT adipocytes. And here they essentially collected a cell lysate and focused in on the wild type microRNA and the microRNA that had been modified with the exo motif. These were biotinylated and they did a pull down looking at the proteomics. So essentially biotinylated MIR34C or MIR26A with or without the exo motif CGGGAG. Uh, that, that material was analyzed by LCMSMS and they looked for any proteins that had more than eight fold increased binding when there was a CGGGAG motif. And this is the result here. These are the top five proteins enriched to bind to the exo motif, and you can see really impressive gains. So this is ALREF, and this is about 350 fold higher, or, or I think it's fold higher. And then RBMX is really high as well, SPDR, FUS, and Syncrypt. So all these are really enriched that these proteins are now sticking to the microRNA with the exo motif compared to the wild type. And we see the same thing here for a different microRNA, MIR26A. These numbers aren't as high, but they still are all significant uh, and increased. The, the order is a little different as well, though. So SDPR is the top hit here, whereas ALIREF was the top hit here. But they all replicate across the two different microRNAs. Here's one more RNA binding protein experiment the authors did. We're here, they're using some siRNAs to knock down ALIREF and FUS and show the effects on the microRNA. So I gave myself a cheat sheet right over here where we see that the CGGG AG motif is always results in more of MIR34C being in the extracellular vesicles. So if you come over here, you'll see that when that microRNA has CGGG AG, it's always higher, 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 and higher compared to the wild type. Then if you add the siRNA and you reduce the refraction of MIR34C, CGGGAG in the extracellular vesicle. So essentially from here, when you add the siRNA, you come down to here or you come down to here. As if you don't have the protein that's going to put that motif microRNA into the exosome. And knocking down ALREF and FUS though doesn't have an effect really on the wild type because it's not being told to go into the extracellular vesicle. Okay, so that's really cool. So we've now seen differences in microRNA levels. We have seen um, differences with motifs that can push microRNAs out of the cell into exosomes or keep them inside. We've shown if you modulate them, you can change things. And really the last question is, can that microRNA be seen to be pushed into another cell type and have function in that second cell type. So to do that experiment, the authors used BAT cells as a donor and they overexpressed four different microRNAs, a scramble, the MIR34C wild type, the MIR34C CAUG, and the MIR34C CGGGAG again. I know you guys are getting used to seeing these guys. 
So they overexpressed them here and they looked to see what they could find in the AML12 hepatocytes, knowing that those exo motifs would push more out into the media, would more of it be taken up by the AML12 hepatocytes. So here we see the levels of endogenous MIR34C, which was at about 1,000 copies per MIR1033P in the donor cells. And the recipient cells was a significantly lower value of sort of baseline MIR34C, about 50 copies or so to 1033P. And this was a transfection experiment. And this is the amount that got induced in these different cell lines. And you can see that the induction was totally reasonable. It wasn't like a super physiologic overexpression as some experiments have. Uh, this was in some moderate range, uh, excuse me, a moderate amount where of, of all the groups, CAUG is about twice as much, uh, sort of a doubling of the MIR34C, but much more subtle amounts added of these two groups. And yet, when we look in the recipient cells, and it doesn't look impressive here, but we see that there is a big delivery efficiency gain of MIR34C. So compared to the wild type, in which not much more was gained into the recipient cells, we saw about a 5% increase in CAUG and CGGAG motif modified MIR34C. So these aren't big numbers, but you know, it was in the same ballpark, these two right here. And so once the microRNA moves into the cell, the last part of this is what is it doing? Does it have an effect on gene expression? So the authors identified four different genes, RAS, NOTCH1, E2F5, and VAMP2, all of which were reported to be MIR34C targets. And they looked to see what would happen. Sorry, I should back up for a moment. These, and I probably should have shown this earlier, but these are the modifications in MIR34C. And you can see that just some of the nucleotides were changed. They also changed these on the other side of the hairpin loop on the three P side so that the hairpin loop stayed intact as well. And again, relative to gene expression, and this is all compared to the scramble, we saw that when you add the wild type MIR34C, we have a little bit of increase of all four of these proteins, but none of that is statistically significant. If you add the CAUG motif, you end up with lower values across all four samples, two of which were significantly decreased in gene expression. And if you did the last one, you see that three of the four go down and all of these were statistically significant and lowered the gene expression. So this was the last figure of, of the paper and this is the full story. The argument is that if you have cells, those microRNAs in the cells have motifs, either cell motifs or exomotifs. And certain proteins act as like barcode scanners, as you see here, Aliref and FUS and others. And they can deduce whether that microRNA should be loaded into an exosome, leave the cell and have some function on some distal cell, or if that microRNA should be retained in the cell and function within the cell itself. So uh, to conclude the pieces of this uh, paper at this point, microRNAs are specifically sorted into extracellular vesicles. Motifs on microRNAs direct them to be cell or EV enriched. There are five RNA binding proteins, SDPR, FUS, Aliref, Syncrip, and RBMX, which preferentially interact with the exomotif. And exomotif modified MIR34C is preferentially uptaken by recipient cells and decrease the gene expression of four known MIR34C targets. Okay, so that is to me the, the crux of the manuscript. And at this point, I have a lot to say about some concerns I have, but at this point I thought we could open things up and, and maybe see what's in the chat uh, or see that. So Ken, what, uh, what should we do at this point? Yeah, thanks, Mark. I think we can do that. Um, we do have quite a few questions in the chat. And I, I just want to say, I, I mean, I know that we have a lot of people on the call today, and we usually just go for an hour. But Mark has said that he's happy to stay around for a little bit longer. So um, so why don't we why don't we do uh, do some questions now? So Paula Vermeer asks, why does removing a cellular motif lead to incorporation of the microRNA in the EV? without having to add an exomotif. This makes it seem that the absence of a cellular motif leads to default packaging of the microRNA into the EV. That's confusing, at least to me. Um, any, any comments on that? Oh, that's a great point. 
I uh, hadn't considered that. That is, I guess, confusing to me as well. Maybe it simply normalizes out the difference between the two, where if 80% of it was supposed to be staying in the cell, now it's more 50-50, and that's the difference that we're seeing. I don't have a great answer on that. Yeah, uh, Ruben or, or Ron, do you want to chime in there? Um, so I would like to add something that um, I think we should also keep in mind that there are also, or there is also passive um, loading of uh, exosomes. So uh, in general, you take all the microRNAs and you will see uh, corre somehow a correlation between what you have in the cell, what you have in the exosomes. That, but this motif seems to increase uh, the sorting uh, very significantly uh, for many microRNAs or to induce the cellular retention. So uh, in my point of view here, there is, the way I see here is that there is like a fight to say, like a, between retention and sorting. And uh, if you um, remove one of the factors that mediate the sorting, then probably the passive loading um, gets enhanced. And probably it happens the, the same in the opposite direction if you remove um, cell-related motifs. Okay, um, so I, I just want to I, I just want to make a clarification about about terms here to make sure that we're talking about, uh, all talking about the same thing. So you're using the term exosome. Are you referring to the extracellular vesicles from the light from the the endosomal pathway, or are you referring to just all small EVs? Because there seems to be a mixing of these terms in the in the manuscript. Yeah. Um, so in the manuscript, we didn't. Uh, do like a demonstration that they come from the uh, endosomal pathway. Um, we believe they are enriched in exosomes just because they, um, you know, they are enriched in the CD63, CD, uh, CD9, and other classical exosomal markers. Uh, but yeah, we haven't done the proof, the real proof that they are really coming from the endosomes. Right, because that, I mean, that can also have a very big influence if you're talking about all, you know, all EVs. And I think that um, Clotilde Terry's group and others have shown that there can be, there can certainly be these markers on the plasma membrane EVs as well. So, you know, the sorting machinery might be very different depending on where it is in the, in the cell. So that's, um, that's also an interesting point that maybe is worth further exploration. So let's go to Fabrice uh, Lucien, who asks, is there a correlation between microRNA half-life and enrichment within EVs? So this would be the turnover question. Yeah, maybe the authors can answer that. I, I can't address that. I, we didn't we didn't actually look at that question, so I I don't think we have any answer to that we could go back and try to look, but we don't have that information. Right. Yeah, that's that's definitely an interesting question, and I, I see that Juan Pablo Tosar is on the call too, and he's he's certainly interested in what um, what RNA turnover does with um, with extracellular RNAs in general. Um, let's uh, let's see here. Sean Leupold asks: Are these motifs specific to the mature microRNA? Or what if they're, you know, are they also going to be packaging the pre-microRNA? And then he asks also, are they located in a specific region of the microRNA or randomly distributed? So does, does it matter exactly where they, where they are? I don't think anyone looked at the pre-microRNAs in this paper. There was some discussion in the supplemental material about five prime or three prime with most of these motifs being described as being more on the three prime end of the microRNA, I believe, rather than the five prime end. Dr. Marti uh, Garcia Martin, is that how you recall yeah. it? Yeah, no, uh, Dr. Haluska is absolutely right. Uh, we haven't explored the pre microRNA. This is something we are um, currently exploring. Um, and regarding the location of these uh, motifs, uh, for most of them, they are towards the, the end of the microRNA. So we, we did a comparison between the first half of the microRNA and the second half, uh, when you see from five to three prime. And then most of them, they were in the three, in the second half, located more to, towards the three prime, except for one that was more abundant in the first half. Great, yeah, and I see that I see that Elena is also saying a little bit lower down in the in the chat box um, that there are other smaller NAs or fragments of them in EVs, and so I guess then the, then you know it'd be interesting to see what happens if you put this thing onto a tRNA or. Or something else. So, um, so, so, yeah, definitely some interesting questions. Um, going back to the, the, you know, the endosomal pathway, the lysosomes, and so on. Uh, Lindsay Block is is um, is saying, can we actually say cargo is specifically packaged if it's in the 
in in that in that system. So I guess it I guess in some in you know we maybe we need to do some cell biology work there to understand you know exactly what the what the pathway is for the release of these specific um, these specific uh, uh, mo motifs. And next, uh, Juan Pablo um, asks: Is the increase of the uh, MIR thirty four C with the CAUG in recipient cells statistically significant? Um, and are there examples of enrichment in recipient cells without overexpression in the donor cells? I mean, I think it was uh, borderline statistically significant in the paper. It looks like there's a little bit of an increase. So I assume so. I don't know the answer to the second part of that question, though. I don't think they looked at that. What we saw is that when we overexpress the CAUG uh, version, um, somehow the wild type version got, got down. So it seems that there is like a um some some feedback regulation uh by mir 34 so probably mir 34 also regulates its own expression so that's why when you overexpress all these versions in the cells the total dose of mir 34 uh, doesn't really change um so this is what we saw and then the second question maybe just uh, to and yeah. just to comment about methodologically uh ruben did these experiments using digital uh PCR and with specific primers that could distinguish the donor, the, the added microRNA from the from the uh, original microRNA. So there is somehow a cellular recognition and, and the endogenous does not stay constant when you get this uh, transfection with the exogenous, it tends to go down. Yeah, no, no, no. Um, so I can add that. It, I mean, this was very important because the, um, the difference between the microRNA versions, uh, sometimes it was only one or two nucleotides. So if you if you want to do it with a regular uh, qPCR, you are not going to be able to distinguish them. Uh, so it was important to use um, the log nucleic nucleic acids, so LNA technology and digital PCR, so that the, we could really distinguish the different versions, and also to measure. Um, you know, and to quantify in an absolute way, so to know how many copies of each of the versions you see in the in both in the recipient cells and in the extracellular vesicles. And then, regarding the second question uh, we were talking, is um, are there examples of enrichment in recipient cells or in EVs without overexpression in the donor cells? So I don't really understand the question. So I, um, so basically, uh, the ba all the basal experiments that we do with the all the microRNAs, you uh, you see that some microRNAs get enriched in the extracellular vesicles. Um, it's something uh, so that we saw in the in the first uh, figures of the paper. So some microRNAs got enriched in the micro in the in the extracellular vesicles. That's that's good. Uh, and any other comments on that one? Um, I'm I'm trying to look through here. I'm trying to look through all, all of the comments and questions and see if there's a, a cup, maybe just a couple more that we do right now, and then we can come back to this. There are a few. So I see that there's some themes that are coming up um, again, um, but but there's there are a couple of questions about the proteins. So here, um, John Satterley is asking. He says, um, "Fus is involved in generating bimolecular condensates. Are any of the other four RNA uh, binding proteins identified also involved in biomolecular condensate functions? Do you, does anyone know that? Maybe a good good thing to look into. Thanks for the suggestion, John. And good and suggestion. then Tom Tom Gallagher is asking: Is it known whether the RNA binding proteins themselves are in the EVs? So can you detect those in the EVs? So uh, what I can say there is that um, well, FUS has uh, pre has been reported previously to um, participate in microRNA function. So it somehow interacts with microRNAs and with argonaut. Um, I think this is the first report that show some uh, relation with the EV loading of microRNAs. And for the other proteins, um, Syncrip was also reported to participate in EV uh, microRNA loading. And I don't think for the other three there was any uh, previous evidence that they participate in this process. And something that we are now exploring is how this happens, how these uh, RNA uh, binding proteins somehow recognize those motifs and lead um, to the enrichment of the microRNA in, into the extracellular vesicles. So uh, we don't know the, the exact mechanism for that. Uh, what we have done is try to, ident try to find those proteins in the EVs um, we couldn't identify any of those 
So this seems to be more like a, a loading. So the, the RNA binding protein recognize the microRNA, load it into the the you know the forming exosome or extracellular vesicle, and then the RNA binding protein stays in the cell. And just uh, two two more questions here about the proteins. One is um, the proposed like how do you see this this binding happening? So Moritz Weigel asks, how do microRNAs interact with these? RNA binding proteins? Is it that the microRNA is in the argonaut as it usually is, and it's also binding to something else? Or is it that there's a handoff? Do you, do you have any speculation about that? And then the other question from, from um, Mikhail Pechtel is, do you know anything about the protein copy numbers? I guess that would be in the, in the cell then because it, they weren't detected in the EBs. Yeah, so Again, this is just a speculation. I guess the, the, micro, the RNA binding protein neck, um, is able to recognize uh, the microRNA probably before handing to Argonaut uh, because we have seen that this um, loading of the microRNAs in the extracellular vesicle happens um, equally efficiently with the 5P uh, and, and, um, and 3P um, microRNA versions. Um, and so it happens with the guide RNAs, with the passenger strand RNAs. Um, so, but we don't have any evidence for that. You know, it's, it's something that we need to explore uh, further. And then um, regarding the copy number that uh, we measured, um, it's in the supplementary figures. Um, so we measured the number of copies of these microRNAs uh, in the vesicles. And, and the number is small. Uh, I mean, this is something that, that has been reported before as uh, Haluska saw, Dr. Haluska saw at, at, in the introduction. Um, so in general, the numbers of the microRNAs, you know, not, not only related to our paper, but um, all microRNAs, in, uh, they are usually in low copy number, but somehow they are still efficient to, um, to lead to some um, changes in the, in the recipient cells even though they are small. What we have seen in this experiment is that when you introduce the motifs, then the copy number of the microRNAs gets increased in the, in the extracellular vesicles. But still the general number is you know, small. It's, we are not talking about thousands of copies per, per EV. We are talking about you know, um, one copy in maybe in a thousand or um, EV. So it's relatively small. Great, okay, good to keep that in mind. So. Um, I think now that we should probably go back to, uh, to Mark and, um, I see, I know that there are more questions here. We'll try to get to everybody. Uh, but let's, um, let's, let's go, let's go ahead with, uh, with Mark's, uh, thoughts here. All right. And, um, yep. Go ahead, Mark. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Ken. So I got the end of the paper and I thought this was really interesting that we have this new motif for exosomes. And I have to tell you my first place, my brain went to was this uh, paper from a decade ago from Stephanie Dimler's group. And so this paper has always bothered me. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but essentially they showed that in endothelial cells, if you activate them with crepal like factor two, you could induce MIR-143 and 145 to sort of reasonable levels. And then you got even more of those two microRNAs going into extracellular vesicles where they could act on smooth muscle cells. And this has always bothered me, this paper, because endothelial cells have really low levels of MIR-143 and 145, and yet smooth muscle cells have really high levels. And so the stoichiometry of how this worked never made sense to me. But I thought, well, maybe if we had these exomotifs on MIR-143 and 145, that could be driving more of these uh, microRNAs like directly out of the cell and into the smooth muscle cells and having some effect on those proteins. The problem was that I didn't see these motifs, particularly this CGGGAG motif on 143 or 145. So then I asked the simple question, well, what are the microRNAs that that motif is found on? And this is where I started getting into some concerns over the paper. So it turns out that CGGGAG is actually a rare motif among mouse microRNAs. Even though it was one of the strongest and is used in many of the experiments, it was only present in three different microRNAs. One is MIR-483, 5P, which is a passenger strand microRNA with very low expression based on data from phantom 5. MIR-1, 
1892, which is really no expression at all across cells, and MIR 2137, which does have some reasonable expression, but only seen in cerebellum embryo and not uh, the cell types seen here. These are also highlighted in red because they're not listed in MIR gene DB as bona fide microRNAs. And so I thought this was a little odd. Uh, this motif is not on abundant microRNAs. It's not on numerous microRNAs. Why would there be a biological mechanism developed around that motif? Uh, that motif also wasn't in any of the universal SEV enriched microRNAs. So I have to tell you, I was very concerned about that. It didn't make sense. So I reached out to the authors, Eric, really terrific in getting back to me and said that I, that was probably too narrow uh, a description, that there's really this CNGGNG motif that is being seen across more cell types that is the universal exo-enriched motif. And indeed, if you start looking at these universal ones, six of 13 do contain the motif. They do seem to be in a couple of different locations. We talked about many of the motifs being on the three prime end. And I think you could argue this one certainly is. This is more in the middle. These two are more towards the front and these two are probably more towards the end as well. So we see some enrichment there. If we look cell type by cell type for all of the microRNAs that have the CNGGNG, there's actually 47 microRNAs that are on their qPCR array. And there is enrichment. Uh, so here it's 5.4 and 4.6 fold for SVEC and AML12 cells, but a more mild enrichment for 3T3L1, C2C12, and, and bat cells. And still the majority of the microRNAs that have that motif are actually not packaged into extracellular vesicles. Uh, if you look kind of across the board at the C and GGNG motif, there are 212 mouse microRNAs that have this motif, but most of these are these four or even five digit microRNAs that most people don't think are real, certainly not bona fide microRNAs. Again, 47 of them were on the qPCR array. And this is just a smattering of the top of the list uh, from the 212. And you can see that all the ones in gray are ones that are generally not considered to be bona fide microRNAs are not in mere gene DB. The ones that were in mere GDB, I looked to see if they were passenger strands and half of them were passenger microRNAs. And these three in boxes were actually some of the exo enriched uh, microRNAs. Now, I think there was an older paper, which I can't remember anymore, uh, the authors concluded that exosomes existed to pull passenger microRNAs out of the cell simply to get rid of them. And that's kind of interesting because half of these are passenger microRNAs. And I can't remember the, that paper, but if someone knows what I'm talking about, please put it in the chat. It would be great uh, to see it. Anyway, that just got me concerned about what that microRNA, excuse me, that motif was all about. And then I started thinking, well, maybe that motif was discovered uh, from some of the particulars of the experimental procedure. One of my concern is that in the quantitative PCR where everything is full change, sometimes very lowly expressed microRNAs have bigger full changes due to sort of noisy changes and that can get incorporated into the data. And in fact, uh, I don't know that's true here, but for the endothelial cells, we see some of the lower values for these microRNAs that were cell specific, whereas we had much more robust values over here for the extracellular vesicles. The second part of that is that many microRNAs were labeled as cell specific, but they were really only cell specific within the construct of this experiment of those five cell types. Now, one example was MIR32 5P. It's listed as an endothelial cell, cell specific microRNA, but its expression is actually fairly low at 20 reads per million uh, per the UCSC genome browser whereas it's much more highly expressed in inflammatory cells seen here in B and T lymphocytes. Uh, this is actually also true for like MIR 150 that shows up, which is also very exclusively expressed in inflammatory cells and really isn't expressed in any reasonable level in the five cell types that they use. So I'm worried that some of the microRNAs that were used aren't the ones, they, they may, they probably, some of them should have been excluded, I think, and that may have changed the motifs that were found uh, because Homer is an interesting program, and I got really concerned about how significant were the Homer results. And actually, when I was reviewing what the uh, what was um, mentioned to the authors about revising the manuscript, someone quoted this from Homer itself. 
I'll, I'll read it out here. It says, due to the finite amount of data and many degrees of freedom in a motif probability matrix, it is easy to find a motif with a seemingly significant p-value. Because of this, we can only trust the most promising of motifs as likely to be real. For most promoter data sets, motifs with a p-value of more than 1 times 10 to the minus 10 or even 1 times 10 to the minus 12 are likely to be false positives. In general, the p-value cutoff should be estimated by randomizing data labels and running the algorithm several times. In practice, you should be start ignoring results that are either below 1 times 10 to the minus 10 or when the results start becoming very different from one another in terms of sequence, yet have similar p-values. Now, I, I mentioned that because all the p-values are generally below this 1 times 10 to the minus 10 value. And the authors address this as well by going back and making sure that everything had a false discovery rate of less than uh, 0 0.01. However, for just to try this Homer thing out, I ended up taking all of the mouse mature microRNAs, and then I randomized them using the random function in Excel and sorted them into quartiles based on that random number. I then took the top and bottom quartiles and compared them using Homer 2, just looking for the length of seven, one of the motifs. I wouldn't expect to find any motifs. There should be nothing significant about my sorting event, which was completely random. And yet I found really significant values here. Uh, 1 times 10 to the minus 27, times 10 to the minus 20, 1 times 10 to the minus 17, 1 times 10 to the minus 12, which were more significant than the motifs that were described in the paper, which I thought was curious. And I've, I've gone back and indeed, these would all have false discovery rates, which would match the 0 0.01 and uh, have the percent of significance per each nucleotide consistent with what the authors uh, responded that they had done for the motifs. So you can be very dangerous to put any sort of data into Homer, and you could probably get motifs to just uh, come out of that. So that also got me a little concerned. Uh, the next thing was that, is the small RNA sequencing data really validating? And so the authors had started with quantitative PCR, and they had then said that the qPCR method found more unique microRNAs, and so they were sticking with it. And they're absolutely true. They did find more by that. However, the small RNA sequencing was not sequenced very deeply. So I initially back calculated this from the lowest RPM values from their supplemental table 10 and found that it was likely underpowered. Now, since then, the authors were kind enough to share with me the small RNA sequencing where they had about a half a million reads per sample, which isn't terrible, but only 47,000 UMIs per sample. And so the difference between the reads and UMIs suggests that they really sequence deeply into a small amount of starting RNA, which will cause you to miss more lowly expressed microRNA. So that's consistent with the difference that they were seeing with quantitative PCR. Uh, the raw data was not yet deposited in a repository, but they were kind enough to provide it on request. As well, one other thing, the normalized data in supplemental table 10 was not your typical uh, reads per million. It was actually boom normalized and only contained a subset of the raw data based on a UMI threshold. But the most concerning part of it is that it really didn't validate the quantitative PCR very well. So we go back to the 13 universal SEV enriched microRNAs, 10 of them, there was no data in the sequencing. And for the three in which there was sequencing, I would argue that only this validates for 1893 and 3T3 cells, and this validates for mere 207 cells so only two of the six actually validated in the quantitative, excuse me, in the small RNA sequencing data. And I, I, so I just don't think that that data really does justice to validating the qPCR because we're just not getting into these microRNAs. But it also suggests that we're dealing with some lowly expressed microRNAs because we weren't able to see them in the RNA-seq data. Another uh, concern that came up to me was regarding the the proteins that bound these motifs. So uh, there's a, a line in the paper that says that Aliref and FUS are involved in the export of microRNAs carrying one of the strongest exomotifs, CGGGAG. And here we see that Aliref and truly does uh, appear to be highly enriched for binding to the CGGGAG. But what does it actually do? And so there's a paper in the nucleic acids research in 2017 that shows that Aliref is an RNA binding protein for nuclear export, normally found in the TREX complex and binds messenger RNAs. Uh, 
in that paper, they talk about there being iClip data and showing the binding motifs for Aliref, which are AGGUA, GGUAA, GUAAG, and CUUCG. None of those motifs really match this. Now, it's quite possible that that Aliref protein has multiple different functions, and that the function described in nucleic acid research is simply a different function than its role with microRNAs. But it is a little odd that it's only expressed in nuclei. So this are, these are images taken from the human protein atlas and across all the different tissues, it's always expressed in nuclei with really no expression or maybe a blush of expression in cytoplasm. And that's also seen here by immunofluorescence. And so I'm knowing that extracellular vesicles, at least I think, and I'm not an expert here, that they're made in the cytoplasm and knowing that the last steps of microRNA formation are in the cytoplasm, I just don't know how this protein that's confined to the nucleus is really having that effect out here. So I think that was another concern that I had uh, with the paper. And the last concern had to do with the last part of the experiment where they were looking at uh, changes in gene expression when they use these exomotifs. So the first thing is, in my mind, microRNAs generally block translation and with lower protein levels, not necessarily the gene expression levels. Uh, for a microRNA to, to lower gene expression levels, it has to behave more like an siRNA with a lot of binding across it. It got weird to me initially because I felt that this should have been done with protein levels, not gene expression levels. But it was also weird that if you gave more MIR-34C wild type, even though you don't get much more in, it still seems to leave more gene expression than the scrambled, as if the scrambled is somehow lowering levels of these genes. And then they were even further leveled with the CAUG and the CGGAG. Now, one thing to note is that these are 23 base pair in length. And there can be some, once you get past 20 nucleotides, there's some funky stuff that the cell has to double strand RNA that's an immune response and can so can initiate some uh, secondary off target effects of um, immune activation, thinking this is like a, a viral RNA that's attacking it. So most inhibitors are thought to should be made at 20 nucleotides or less. And I'm wondering if maybe it was the length of this which is causing some off target effects because. That wouldn't make sense. It's another possibility, though, is that these motif changes that occur result in more binding and make it more like an siRNA. Now, the authors did a direct transfection experiment, and they show that they all behaved equally. So that doesn't seem to be true. And then if you look at how the motifs change relative to the binding sites, as I'll show in the next few slides, it doesn't really hold true either. So I really can't understand how this happened. Uh, the authors also said uh, in describing this data, and this may or may not be the same experiment, so maybe the authors can clarify this for me, but they wrote, given the calculation provided in figure 4D from the manuscript, 28 copies of the CAUG motif containing microRNA and two to three copies of the CGGGAG motif containing microRNA were transferred to each recipient cell under the conditions of this experiment. So if you're only transferring so few copies to each cell, I was surprised you could get this effect across all these different genes. It just seemed a little odd to me. As I mentioned, it's possible that changing these nucleotides makes it more like an siRNA. And I think for notch one, if you see there are two different binding sites for notch one from the paper they cited. And what I've done is, uh, made these comparisons accounting for a bulge as predicted by micro TCDS or just straight across. And for one of the two binding sites, we have three gain of binding positions with these nucleotide changes. So that's this bold here. And so this really does look like an siRNA more, and it's possible that that would have degraded that gene more for notch one. But if you look across the other genes, we don't see that same thing. This is sort of a wash and that actually has more loss of binding. This one is about the same, and this one, E2F5, only has loss of binding no matter how we do it. So I don't think that really explains the gene expression data. It was also odd to me a little bit that those four genes that were selected are not ones that mirtar base describes as validated binding sites for MIR34C. I don't know if that matters at all, uh, MIR-34C is clearly lowly expressed in AML-12 cells. It's seen here as less than 50 copies relative to 103. I don't 
you know, the absolute value on that by the sequencing, there was no MIR34C expression in the gene. So it's really lowly expressed. And when a microRNA is not naturally found in a cell type, I often wonder, even if you overexpress it, if it's going to behave in a biological fashion. So that's a concern. And then the last part was, well, what were the relative levels of the genes in AML12 cells? So I went to gene expression omnibus and just searched for any AML12 data set. Uh, this may or may not be relevant, but the median gene expression levels across that experiment were about 450 or so. And we see that VAMP2 and RAS had levels more in the 100 range, whereas NOTCH1 was about tenfold higher at uh, 1300 or so, as you see here. And in doing that comparison, then starting to put all these pieces together, that you'd need more microRNAs to modify NOTCH1 relative to these other two genes, I would think. And yet everything really comes out about the same in the wash. So regardless about how much microRNA got into the cell or how much protein there was, excuse me, how much gene expression there was in the cell, things were about the same. So uh, just a lot of questions I have about whether this is really sort of an on-target effect or an off-target effect affecting these four genes. And so the last thing I wanted to say about the paper was I... I went back and looked at the data. I just compared the expression levels by the quantitative PCR or the small RNA sequencing that they had provided. And these were the correlations. And I was surprised by how good the correlations were. This is uh, R squared of 0.64, this is 0.61. And so really a question comes down to whether this, the width of this line is biology or noise. And it's possibly biology, that there are motifs that are directing things, or maybe this is sort of technical noise. And I'm looking here at the small RNA sequencing data, and the R squared value here is 0.83, of which I'd be quite jealous for a lot of my experiments. And it reminded me a lot of this figure from Juan Pablo Tozar's paper, which also showed that if a microRNA is highly expressed in a cell, it's highly expressed in an extracellular vesicle, and it's lowly expressed in a cell, it's lowly expressed in an extracellular vesicle, and I'm wondering if maybe that's all this really is, is, is that, and we're, we're overthinking the packaging of microRNAs into extracellular vesicles. So to quickly summarize uh, my concerns, I can't find a biological rationale for a mechanism to traffic CGGG A G motif because it is just really not common. The CNGG and G motif is definitely in many more microRNAs uh, that are a more exo motif enriched, but still not exclusive to that group. Uh, I was concerned about some of the methodology to identify differential microRNAs in extracellular vesicles versus cells. The Homer method uh, easily provides false positive motifs, as I shared, and so it depends on what information is fed into Homer, what motifs you'll get. I didn't feel the small RNA -seq uh, sequencing data validated the quantitative PCR data and suggest that some of the data to drive Homer was derived from the lowly expressed or noisy part of the qPCR data. The location of Aliref protein in the nucleus and its known function in nuclear export seems sort of odd for a role in EV packaging of microRNAs. And I couldn't find a clear rationale for exomotif mir 34 c reducing gene expression. Protein would have been something different, but gene expression of the four target genes where there was really no increase in binding motifs to behave more like an siRNA. We had variable amounts of inputs and variable expression levels all coming out to about the same thing. So those are some of my concerns that I had uh, with the paper, and I'll stop sharing now and, and open this up again. All right, well, thanks for that uh, very detailed analysis, Mark. Um, I'm, I'm really glad that the, that the authors are on the call as well. And I think, you know, we do have, um, we do have some interesting comments, some insightful comments that have been placed in the chat box. And I encourage everybody to look at those. Um, so, um, so, but I, I, I do think that now it's appropriate to give the authors some time to, um, to respond here. And I don't know what's, what's the most, um, uh, what should we say, efficient way to do this? Shall we, shall we go through the concerns in order or how, how do you want to do this? Or is there anything, any, any you know, immediate response that, that, um, that you, Ruben, or you, Ron, would like to start with? 
So obviously, um, Mark raises a lot of important issues, uh, some of which we certainly considered, uh, some of which we certainly didn't consider. Uh, so I think that there'll be uh, uh, certainly food for thought. And maybe let me take a couple of them that are more, I would say, sort of the philosophical ones, and then uh, maybe let Ruben handle ones that uh, uh, deal with the data. But I don't think we're going to be able to address uh, all of these uh, in, in the time. And certainly, I can only stay another few minutes anyway. But let me um, start at the end, or at least give you my thoughts about, I mean, I think at the end, the suggestion is that, uh, that, may, that uh, maybe everything is just random. That uh, that there's ran you know that that was you sort of said that our correlation looks a lot like uh, the pu published correlation of a person who concluded that everything was random, and um, what the main thing I would say about that is, uh, and this sort of also goes back to the identification of motifs in general, is that the purpose of this wasn't to try to do a statistical. Uh, analysis of whether there were or were not motifs. The statistical analysis was an attempt to identify motifs we could test the biology of. Uh, and so I would say that uh, while we didn't test all of them uh, for sure, uh, we tested only a small subset, certainly for the cell motifs that were tested by mutation or the exomotifs that were tested by mutation or by mutation to add or subtract, uh, almost always there was a behavior of the microRNA that changed in the direction that was predicted by what we had believed that function was. So if we added an exo motif, there was more ex, there was more vesicular export. If we took one away, there was more cell retention and uh, opposite was true for the cell. So I think that the statistical correlation is a statistical correlation, but I do think that the ability of these motifs to drive some biology is there because we can show it's there. And that is separate from the question of whether the mi microRNAs get into the recipient cells and can be sufficient uh, to regulate uh, uh, pro mRNA stability or protein expression. Uh, so that would be at least one issue that I would sort of like to deal with. I did think it was interesting, and I, I do appreciate uh, your comments because I hadn't really given any thought, and I don't know if Ruben had given any thought to this notion that we maybe could also change the intrinsic properties of the microRNA, although we didn't see that when we did direct uh, transfections. Uh, maybe the second uh, uh, question that I would uh, like to sort of respond to a little bit is um, the uh, use of Homer, because uh, we struggled a lot with uh, how to do the statistics on that. And Ruben will perhaps recount if he's still here. Yeah, he's still here. I mean, we even contacted the authors of the Homer program. Obviously, when you use Homer to look for a DNA sequence motif, you're looking in the context of the whole genome. So the background is all DNA, right? And so to get, you really need a high statistical threshold to find a motif against all DNA. When you're looking for uh, a motif in microRNAs, the, the total universe is say 700 microRNAs times 22 nucleotides. So it's, it's 14 or 15,000 bases. That's, that's, the whole, that's the whole universe of background. So, and, and we did not do the, the uh, computer experiment that you did, which I think was one way to approach it, which is to try to do some random randomization, uh, create our own randomized library. But we did try to take into account this, this smaller universe of sequence that was the background and, and do the best we could uh, with uh, statistics with that in mind. Um, finally, I'll just, say that uh, that from the very beginning we did not uh, we we did not focus on this issue of uh, whether our five cell types represented all cell types in the universe because we know they don't they don't represent even uh, necessarily perfect examples of 
normal fat, muscle, liver, endothelial cells, because within each of those, there are subtypes of cells to begin with, right? So we know that every one of these cells has intrinsic heterogeneity. And if you have a 3T3L1 fat cell, is that more like an, it's already been shown that it's neither like an, a subcutaneous nor an intra-abdominal fat cell, it's its own fat cell and probably different clones of 3T3L1 will behave differently. So I do accept the fact that uh, we are looking at a, a limited universe. I would try to counter, you know, that limitation by saying, you know, that in the end we were able to uncover what we feel is uh, what site or sequences that do have this ability to change the export versus the retention of microRNAs. And we are, you know, our ultimate uh, goal was both to try to understand potentially the biological process, but also to figure out how this could be manipulated. I noticed one question in the chat was, could you use this to manipulate microRNA retention or export to change it? Uh, it's um, their therapeutic potential, and that's sort of a direction we're going. Uh, but I think that, uh, you know, you do raise a lot of important points. Um, you know, maybe another two years of revision, we could have dealt with a few of them. Uh, this was, uh, th there were, uh, the first, I, we, I will just uh, make a confession since a lot of this is published anyway, but, you know, reviewer one in the initial review raised 28, uh, 28 separate comments, all of which required extra experiments. Uh, so it was not, uh, at, but, and most of them weren't your questions, <laughs> even. They, they were 28 of her or his questions. So we have a lot of questions. Uh, so, uh, but uh, it, it, this is a challenging field. And for those of you who uh, work at this even more than we do, I think you appreciate the challenges to try to get to some of the heart of this biology, but uh, we're trying. Uh, I don't know if Ruben, you want to take on a few questions, uh, but I hope, hopefully that helps give some background to some of the uh, questions you raised, Mark. Well, yeah, thanks very much, Ron. I, and, and I just want to say on behalf of everybody who's on the call, thank you for, for your time today um, and for, for joining us and, and giving your insights too. Um, so I know, I know that you're going to have to go, but we, we really do appreciate that you, uh, that you joined today. So th thanks very much and all the best on the continuing work. All right, Ruben, did you have... Uh, did you have yeah, um, yeah, I would like to add something there. Um, so um, I guess um, I would like to start with the Homer. So um, so what you can see in the paper is not all what Homer uh, releases. Uh, so uh, when you run Homer, there are some motifs that are um, in, a little bit enriched only in your population of interest and the, the variability in the nucleotides is too high. So you need to really you know, make a an deep and careful analysis of uh, what Homer tells you. So what you see in the paper is only the motifs that uh, were present in a high number of microRNAs from a, you know, from a big population of, we are talking about around 200 microRNAs. And they lead to le more than threefold enrichment in the, in the cellular vesicles or in the cell uh, for the cell uh, motifs. And, and we also excluded motifs that were too random, like uh, you know, too many fluctuations in the nucleotides, because that's that cannot be a real motif recognized by a RNA binding protein. So, uh, and uh, as uh, Ron said, uh, so we did multiple experiments to really demonstrate that these um, some of these motifs are functional. We didn't demonstrate all because if you see the paper, we um, we found like a I don't know. 15 exomotifs, uh, 15 cell motifs. So uh, it's not possible to demonstrate all of them, um, uh, you know, in a short time. Uh, and this is something we would like to do. But there are some cases where, the, for example, for the cell motif A G A E C, we we do like you know complementary experiments. We uh, remove this motif, and we see uh, that the the, the microRNAs they don't go to the uh, they are not retained so uh, so much, and we did the opposite experiment. We introduced it, and we got the opposite result. So, I think for some of these motifs, uh, there is clear uh, experimental evidence that they they do what are they are supposed to do. Then the second thing I would like to uh, highlight here is that we didn't do any pre-selection of the microRNA. We didn't focus on microRNA that high that are highly expressed or low expressed. So. Um, I think it's clear to me uh, that the, the abundance of the microRNA, they depend 
mostly on the target abundance. So if you target, if the target gene is highly expressed, then probably you need a lot of microRNA to really regulate that gene. So we didn't want to introduce more bias there. Uh, so we 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 just select all the microRNAs that were um, expressed, uh, you know, by the qPCR. Um, there was also some um, cleaning of the data from our side. So we used um, Mirbase um, database to um, discard micro microRNAs that are not uh, realistically considered microRNAs. Um, so what you see here is that all the microRNAs are disvalidated by Mirbase. Um, obviously, there are other databases that will tell you, okay, this microRNA is not a microRNA, but um, we are. We use a mirror base, which is quite um, uh, abundantly used. And then something else I would like to add here is that uh, we don't claim that uh, the exomotive is something that is the only method for regulating the microRNA distribution. So if you take any of the of the, any of the third types that uh, we we use um, and use some the number of microRNAs that uh, contains either one or two or three, you know, um, you know, uh, all the motifs. Uh, we never get more than 50% of the microRNAs. So you still find 50% of the microRNAs that we don't really know how they um, are regulated in terms of uh, going to the exosomes or being retained in the cell. So um, there should be other mechanisms, um, not only the motifs. And, you know, I, I, I think from our experimental evidence and also from previous uh, literature that um, there is, um, you know, these motifs work and they are functional, uh, but there should be something else that is important to keep in mind. Um, yeah, and um, yeah, I don't know what else. Um, I'll yeah. add in, and thank you for both of your comments. I think they were very helpful and I certainly, uh, some can be confused on things, but to the point about uh, not wanting to bias your data of, of what microarrays you look at, that may be true, but it may be a value to go back now and look at microRNAs. If you are, if the argument is these are functional effects, like there's the microRNAs that you're going to put in exosomes go and do something functional, then you might want to look at the microRNAs that are more abundantly expressed in those cell types that they're coming from and look for ones that were abundant and put in exosomes and see if the motifs that you found already still match when you go to this like more reduced subset of more likely functional microRNAs and uh, away from the noise. Because again, just from the small RNA sequencing data, you could tell that these were the, some of the more lowly expressed microRNAs across your samples that you got a big signal from. And if you can replicate that with some of the more abundant ones, I would feel much better about the motifs that you guys found. Although you clearly show functionality, which I would agree with. I, I can't argue against that. And just to comment on that, Mark, um, you know, I agree with you in general that there may be high, highly expressed and exported microRNAs. But if you have a low expressed microRNA that is preferentially targeted for secretion, then what's left in the cell may indeed be low. And when you look at the tissue, you're, you're, you're not getting a representative because we're dealing at least in vitro with one cell at a time. You kind of know the microRNA had to come from somewhere. And the only the only place it could have come from is is the you know is that donor cell even if it's low in that cell and it's relatively abundant in the exosomes. Yeah, and actually, just one minor point: if you take those microRNAs that are highly enriched in all the cell types and you try to identify how many of them they have, um, you know, any kind of exomotive, uh, you will find that they are much more enriched in that population, subpopulation of microRNAs than any other microRNAs. So the, the more my, the more exomotives they have, the more uh, enrichment uh, in the exosomes. And the same thing happens with the cell motifs. I, I am going to have to sign off, but uh, thank you for letting us attend. And I'll let Ruben finish up with you. Thank you. Lizzie, Lizzie Delar, do you want to, you, you had two, I think, interesting comments here. Would you like to unmute and ask these questions of Ruben and Mark? Uh, hi, yeah, I just wanted to ask, you showed in one of the supplementary figures um, that there's a higher GC content of some of the microRNAs, which are commonly enriched in all of the cell types, um, along with the lower Gibbs free energy. So do you think that rather than the motif specifically, um, the, the GC content might be a more sort of general mechanism? I don't really know how the 
general GC content can make um, can participate in that. Um, so we have seen that there is a correlation between the GC content and exosomal enrichment. Um, but we claim that the, this is probably because as, as Mark uh, saw that exomotives, they, use, they usually contain more Cs and more Gs than, um, than what you expect as a, you know, an, as an average um, nucleotide um, sequence. So um, yeah, we haven't explored that. And, and the other point that you brought up, which I think is very interesting is the Delta G. So the, the Gs uh, free energy. Um, so that points that the microRNAs that um, are good in going to the exosomes, they might have some sort of secondary structure, uh, but we haven't explored that. Uh, but, but I think it's something that we, we should look at in the, in the coming years. The, the other question I just wanted to ask with your motifs in the different cell types, did you, for example, take one motif found in one cell type and search for that in the other cell types or do any comparison between them? Because um, it looked like some of them were quite similar to each other, I'd say. Yeah, um, so uh, for example, what we saw is that if, um, so we, some of the motifs we introduced in, in different cell types, uh, like the ones in the MIR-34, we introduced in, in brown adipocytes, in, uh, in AML-12 hepatocytes, and also in endothelial cells. And we saw a different response by, 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 the, by the cell types. So some of the motifs were very efficient in the cells that we identified initially those motifs, and they didn't do much in the other cells. Although there was an also enhancement in the, in the secretion of the microRNAs. So that points that each cell type should have something um, that recognizes these motifs differently. So for example, uh, this is what we, we think is that they, they might have different levels of the uh, RNA binding proteins recognizing those motifs, uh, but we haven't um, analyzed that. Yeah, so we have I, I, Bastian Fromm is on is on the line here. So he's he's uh, he's behind the Mir Gene DB uh, database for those of you who don't who don't know. Um, so so did you have a perspective here for us? Yeah, definitely. Uh, thanks first of all for really good presentation and really good discussion. Um, thanks, Mark. And so for the micron a perspective on the sorting into the EVs, this is certainly really. Uh, obviously, we had 217 participants at, at, at the peak today, so very interesting topic for many people. But um, I think um, what, what Mark said, I'd like to kind of repeat it again. Uh, it is very important if you are studying the effects, the biological effects of microRNAs that are, or are not sorted into EVs you might want to make sure that they are actually microRNAs or can work as a microRNA. So it could be that there's a lot of RNAs sorted into EVs based on motifs um, that actually do not end up in argonaut and in the risk complex. Thus, they are not able to downregulate anything in a recipient cells. So I think what I would do, actually we might as well do it with the data, is uh, to restrict uh, what you did, not uh, uh, to to DP, to actually bona fide micron A's and find out if your signal holds up or maybe actually the signal gets stronger for real and highly expressed micron A's. Because the, it's one thing to say, yeah, there's a big deregulation. Um, but the other thing is, do actually those RNAs reach a physiologically relevant level in the recipient cell or not? So that's my five cents here. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a wonderful point, Anna. Um, yeah, as far as I know, uh, in the last years, there has been some research on trying to understand if the EVs, microRNAs, are really loaded into argonaut or not. And because I think something that is um, very important in the field is that re despite having a very low number of copies of microRNAs in the EVs, they are quite functional or, or they are very strong um, in the in recipient cells in mediating sun effects. So one question is whether those EVs somehow are connected to the argonaut in the recipient cells and lead to more uh, functionality. This is uh, something that we don't know. Um, I mean, when we did the calculation in the paper uh, to see how many copies of the uh, microRNAs get 
uh, delivered to the recipients as uh, we were a bit surprised that then the copy number was relatively small so uh yeah so this is one possibility but maybe these micro rnas are going straight you know to uh bind to argonaut and mediate the function when they are delivered through the evs uh but we haven't explored that yet but this is this is definitely a very important point that we should do yeah Agreed. all right thanks for those comments um i wanted to ask uh, michiel pechtel if he wants to say a few things um he had some insightful comments about the nuclear proteins and um and more so michiel do you uh do you want to Share yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you very well. Cool. Uh, fantastic discussion. I, uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, um, and also the comments and um, uh, yeah, the very insightful comments that uh, concerns that were made by Mark. I wanted to put some um, defense then for the, for the authors in a sense for the nuclear protein, for example. I think multiple people have shown that nuclear proteins, even though they're highly um, enriched in the nucleus, they can transport very rapidly um, to the cytoplasm and back, such as the LA protein that has been found uh, by some of our studies, but also uh, by others have been repeated that LA can play a role in small RNA sorting into exosomes. So that's one thing about that uh, concern. Um, and I think that, that uh, in general, that these two dynamics and indeed these co-culture experiments, there you have dynamics of, of EVs. EVs can um, can continuously basically be taken up by cells. Um, uh, so there might be a continuous flow. So even though you, you show uh, three copies of a microRNA in these recipient cells that should not be there, um, if they're continuously replenished, um, and indeed if, there's a lot of ifs still, but uh, they get into Argonaut, they might have, uh, um, uh, they might have this, 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 let's say, canonical uh, function of microRNAs in, um, in regulating uh, gene expression. So uh, even though I think this paper was not really about the functional uh, aspects, because I think there's a thousand other questions we can um, wonder about these functional aspects, particularly in light of the first um, or, the, or a previous uh, debate that we had here on your, um, uh, on your EV Journal Club, uh, Ken. So I think uh, maybe people will remember that. Um, there's still a lot to show there, but on the sorting and the sorting motifs, I'm also, uh, um, the, one of the papers that was, was shown in the beginning of the presentation um, was a, a PNAS paper that we, uh, where we I think, uh, showed that viral microRNAs are really transferred to non-infected cells. This is, I think, it, it, it relieves all the debate if a microRNA is produced in one cell or the other. So potentially there are other systems possible beyond the cells that, that these authors used uh, to really show the transfer of uh, uh, microRNAs, and, and then you don't have this, uh, these questions like where they were made or what is the stability. Uh, the other thing is that uh, a paper where we looked at sorting was with uh, modifications on the three prime end, particularly NTAs, and we showed that adenylation and uridylation can have a role in this sorting. And then you also kind of omit the whole idea that there is uh, a random uh, problem because these uh, isomers are dependent on the um, uh, of course, on the expression level of those microRNAs. And we saw this globally. So we saw global sorting of urinated uh, microRNAs in EVs, and maybe not as strong as what the authors found here. Um, but that's another thing that I think we look uh, for. And these motifs, for, for example, urination um, uh, is a motif for LA protein to bind on. So I think that's definitely something to, to consider. So not only these sequencing motifs um, and that were shown here, which are, I would say, internal motifs, but also uh, others. And then finally, one more um, idea that, that I had is that if you have very lowly abundant microRNAs, um, and the, of course this debate on the stoichiometry of how many microRNAs are now in each uh, vesicle, and it might be only one in a million, um, but you can imagine if you are a very lowly expressed microRNA, uh, I don't know if, this, if there are mathematicians uh, here, but if you are a very lowly uh, expressed microRNA, let's say one copy in a cell, what is the chance that that microRNA actually does get into uh, an EV? Specifically, we know that um, cells, they do make uh, a lot of EVs, but not, well, uh, let's say not billions. And I don't know how many copies of, of a microRNA we have. I'm not even talking about the canonical microRNA, let's say the mature microRNA, the, the 21 nucleotide, but with all these isomers as well, because we know there's a lot of isomers. 
um, as well for each micronate that you don't pick up with PCR. At least you kind of distinguish them, but you do pick up that with sequencing. Um, so I'm just wondering, if, is it even possible for a very lowly abundant micronate to compete uh, with all the other micronates that are there and then still get into an EV? I don't know, maybe at least uh, uh, if the cells don't make so much EVs, I would wonder. So there seems to be, there must be some kind of sorting mechanism. So, um, and wrapping up, I think it was a really uh, excellent discussion and I really commend uh, the authors to come here and uh, listen to the, to the concerns. I think this really helps uh, uh, the scientific discourse. And I was hoping actually that such type of uh, scientific discussions would also uh, occur somewhere else. For example, the AQRNA seq paper. I don't know if people have seen that paper. I think there's a lot of debate there. So, um, uh, yeah, uh, applause for for you, Ruben, and uh, of course your uh, boss. All right. Well, thank you, thank you, Mikhail, for for those comments. And I do um, I do see that there is some support in the chat also for maybe turning this into something that we can share even wider with the community. So, um, so certainly the analysis that Mark has done and then the responses that the authors have had, and maybe that is, maybe that is a good idea and something that we can consider to, to help move this area forward. It's been a really fun uh, hour and a half for me anyway, and I think for many of you, and, you know, we still got a hundred people on the call at the end. It's, it's, um, it's, it's clear that there's a lot of interest in this area. Um, and I want to commend the authors, uh, Ruben and Ron. Um, and also, um, of course, Mark for presenting today and for, for sharing his analysis with us. Thank you all. And uh, thank you for joining. Thanks for all the comments from the audience. And I hope that you all have a great rest of the week. And I look forward to seeing you again sometime soon at the next EV Club. So take care, everyone. Bye now. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Thank you all for coming. Bye. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Ken. Thank you. Bye-bye.